guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's an honor and real pleasure to introduce Dr. Philippe Armand. Uh, Philippe uh, did his uh, bachelor degree at Princeton in molecular biology and then went to UCSF where he did uh, MD, PhD, and then went to the Brigham for starting his training and very quickly climbed the ladder to be an associate professor and the director of the clinical research in lymphoma. Uh, Philippe uh, has uh, published more than 100 papers in the field of allogeneic stem cell transplantation, lymphoma, and GDHD. Uh, these were high input papers in uh, cancer cell, the New England Journal, blood, and JCO. And actually one of the uh, things that uh, those who do transplantation may know well is the disease risk index that we call the ARMA index at the meeting. And uh, basically it's uh, really permitted to stratify uh, within a certain diseases uh, ba based on the disease status, the outcome of transplantation. So it made comparison uh, between certain publication in each disease much uh, better analyzed. So uh, Philippe received many awards uh, in teaching in, uh, for academic achievement, for his compassionate patient care. Uh, he received the George Canellos uh, Award in uh, 2012. But the one that uh, really uh, caught my attention is the Princeton Curie Award. I didn't know you had the Curie Award, but I think it's a very, very important one. <laughs> so uh, Philippe, uh, without over, uh, without much elaboration, give you more time to talk. Welcome, and we're glad to have you. <coughs> Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me okay even if I walk around? Okay. So, so thank you so much for having me. And I think I have like 109 slides. So what I'm going to do for you guys is I'm going to start with the end, so if you have other stuff to do, uh, you can do it quickly. So this is usually where I end by thanking all the people who have mentored me and helped me, who uh, clearly deserve a lot of thanks, and, and most, if not all, of the credit for what I'm going to tell you about. But the, the person that I really wanted to thank today was Dr. Corey um, for, for many things, uh, for, for teaching me some about uh, wisdom and about friendship, about kindness, uh, and I think for for showing me that uh, it's possible to be to have such a um, such a, a deep love of life to be such an exceptional friend, father, husband. So, and and most of all, uh, I think an exceptional physician. The rest of what I'm going to talk about, I think, doesn't matter nearly as much if we can uh, remember that and and try to, try to bring some of that in, uh, in the rest of our lives. Okay, now I go back to the beginning. So, so these are my disclosures. Uh, I have some off-label use, uh, conflict of interest of consultancy and institutional research funding, despite which I still wash my own dishes. Uh, and, and the outline of this talk uh, that I'm gonna try to follow is I'm gonna focus mostly on uh, PD-1 blockade in relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, and then talk a little bit about non-Hodgkin lymphoma, a little bit about next steps in Hodgkin lymphoma, and then a little bit about uh, a life beyond lymphoma if there is such a thing. You're looking at me, Chris, like there is no such thing. Yeah, okay. so, so let's start just in case uh, any of you, which I highly doubt is not familiar with the basics of checkpoint blockade, uh, you know that checkpoint receptors act as brakes on the immune system, and that tumors in many cases uh, can use these pathways to, evade, ho to evade host immunity. Now we have a number of checkpoint blocking monoclonal antibodies in clinic that can reverse this process, increase anti-tumor immunity. The best characterized ones are PD-1, CTLA-4. Most of this talk is gonna focus on PD-1. And you all know about the, really, the resounding successes of this approach in solid tumor oncology, which has led to many uh, FDA approvals and, and breakthrough designations already. There, there is a, a, a bit of a unique story of a PD-1 blockade specifically in Hodgkin lymphoma, which is where we'll begin. So remember, Hodgkin lymphoma has a unique pathology in that unlike many other lymphomas, it's characterized by these isolated tumor cells. 
that are surrounded by a, a bris but somehow ineffective inflammatory infiltrate. And, and part of the answer to the question of why that might be, how the immune system can surround the Hodgkin cells and yet not eliminate them, came from work that was done a few years ago in, in Margaret Chip's lab, uh, showing that Hodgkin lymphoma, classical Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, very frequently harbors genetic amplification at 9P24. And the most direct targets of these amplification events are the PD-1 ligands, pd one and pd 2 Also, it turns out JAK2 sits on the 9P24 amplicon. So it gets amplified, and through JAK signaling, there is further expression of the PD-1 ligand. And then a less common but still probably relevant event in Hodgkin is EBV infection, which also directly drives pd one expression. So the result is there are uh, several uh, complementary mechanisms uh, that are highly prevalent and that lead to uh, increased expression of the genes for the PD-1 ligands. Since then, uh, there, there has been further work done to uh, characterize 9P24 amplification in more detail using fish testing. Uh, and as you can see here, this is from a paper by Marit Romer looking at just over 100 newly diagnosed patients. So these are untreated patients. And if you look by fish, basically all of them have deregulation at 9P24, which ranges from copy gain to amplification, a few translocations, polysomy. But in this case, there was only one, uh, one tumor that did not have 9P24 uh, amplification at some level. And in that study, um, uh, the increased level of 9P24 amplification was associated with increased stage and possibly with worsened PFS. So all in all, what this means is that on the surface of the reed sternberg cell itself, there is very frequent expression of the PD-1 ligand, pd one pd 2 which is shown here. So this is a, a double immunohistochemistry with in brown pd one and in red PAX5 confirming that there is expression, but that also this expression is indeed on the tumor cell surface and not just microenvironmental. And this is true in the majority of, of Hodgkin uh, cell lines uh, that were examined here. So all of this, uh, I think, strongly suggested that this tumor uh, may be unique in having this, uh, this genetically hardwired dependence on the PD-1 pathway for survival, which might be exploitable therapeutically. So we now have a lot of clinical results to, uh, to back up this hypothesis. There were two phase one studies that were first presented a couple of years ago that were pan-hematologic malignancy studies that were enrolled across myeloma and non-Hodgkin, uh, some myeloid diseases. Uh, but both of them had a separate expansion cohort for classical Hodgkin lymphoma based on the biology of the disease. One study was uh, with the PD-1 antibody nivolumab with Checkmate 39, and one with pembrolizumab, the study was uh, Keynote 13. As you can see, similar patient population, young patient, which is something that comes up over and over in, in Hodgkin lymphoma trials, and extensively pre-treated patients in both studies, a median of five prior lines of therapy. And this summarizes the outcome at the time last presented. The uh, overall response rate was 87% with Nevo, 58% with Pembro, which was mostly driven partially in the CR rates were 26 and 19% here. Uh, note the, the, the NEVO results that are reported were not were by investigator uh, review. Uh, and by central review, the, the response rate dropped to be more in line with, uh, with the rest of, the, of, of these studies. This was the combined waterfall plot for both studies. So as you can see, basically all tumors have some shrinkage at the time of best response. So here, 94% of tumors. And here are the spider plots. Uh, and, and this is, I think, the, the most... Um, the most gratifying aspect of this work and something that has, that has often characterized the excitement around checkpoint blockade is not necessarily the response rate, but the durability of responses. So here you can see many of the responses are maintained, and there's now about two and a half years of median follow-up on the PEMBRO study, uh, and, and many patients still in remission. And now also re uh, reports, most of them, uh, or presented orally, not yet published, but uh, uh, one of them published uh, the phase two studies of both Nevo and Pembro, which followed the, the studies I just presented. So they're a little bit complicated because both of them were three cohort studies. The cohorts are slightly different, which is uh, meant to confuse, I think, and successfully has. Uh, but uh, Checkmate 205, which was in Nevo phase two, there's a cohort A, which were patients that had prior autotransplant and prior brentuximab. Cohort B, uh, which, uh, I'm sorry, cohort A had no prior brentuximab, right? So those patients were brentuximab naive. Cohort B had prior autotransplant, prior brentuximab. 
And cohort C, which was the largest cohort, so 100 patients, uh, also prior autotransplant, and they could have had BV uh, pre or post transplant. Uh, and here's again the, the summary of the response rate with a, a pretty homogeneous uh, response rate of about 70%, uh, mostly, again, uh, PRs with a few CRs. The same kind of waterfall plots that I showed you earlier. And uh, these are the, the PFS curves uh, as last shown. Uh, in most of these, the follow-up is still relatively short, so the tail end of the curves are not particularly stable uh, and they vary with the time of reporting. But in, in general, uh, it looks like the median PFS probably is somewhere in the one to two year range. Although that, that will take some refining. And then the comparable study uh, was the Pembro study, the Keynote 87, which enrolled 210 patients, again across three cohorts, depending on transplant, BV, uh, but cohort two was patients who were transplant ineligible. So this is by virtue of having chemorefractory disease. And here again is a summary of results, and the, the one that I've highlighted is the response rate of the patients in cohort two, because this is the only uh, patient population in phase two that is transplant ineligible. And in fact, the label, the FDA label for nivolumab following the phase two was just for, trans, uh, for um, transplant relapse patients, but it doesn't seem like the drugs are less effective uh, in patients even with more chemorefractory disease. And here are similar waterfall plots, so no less impressive. Uh, so, so I think the, the sum total of this experience uh, is pretty homogeneous in terms of the kind of responses that are induced by these agents. Uh, i just say a few words about the, the safety because clearly the toxicity profile is different from that of chemo uh, and should be respected because uh, there are some significant toxicities, but they are relatively limited in terms of their prevalence. So this is a summary of the phase one, phase two, 105 patients were treated in EVO across a disease across chemo malignancy, so myeloma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which is about 20% of patients who had related grade three to five AE, one patient who passed away from pulmonary complication of this drug, so, so about 1% treatment-related mortality, uh, and Pembro, similar 16% uh, just in the Hodgkin lymphoma patients. The other patients, uh, the, the data has not been presented yet. Uh, and breaking it down by disease, it doesn't seem to matter uh, what, what kind of histology you're treating, and in fact, those numbers are similar to those in solid tumors. The, the toxicity profile uh, is relatively uniform with these drugs, but it is important because with patients with Hodgkin lymphoma in particular, we worry that their previous uh, potential pneumotoxic drugs like or radiation or bentuximab or BCNU uh, might predispose them to increased pneumonitis, and that does not seem to be the case, at least to a significant degree. This is another way of looking at it, uh, these are the, uh, again from the phase one study, the toxicities are color-coded by grade and separated by organ system. And you can see that even among the 20% the of grade three toxicity, about half of them are lab abnormalities. So the clinically relevant grade three and above toxicity is probably about 10%. And then the last way I'll show you this is by time, uh, and only to make the point that while the majority of toxicity happens early, of course that's where also most patients are on study, uh, there are significant toxicities that happen later. So there are, for example, these, these uh, all grade three immune-related toxicities that happen after about six months on treatment. So I, I think that the point to make, which again, I, I know you guys uh, probably know better than I do, is when treating patients with these drugs, it is always important, no matter how long they've been on study, to remember that diarrhea is, in my mind, colitis until proven otherwise, a cough is pneumonitis until proven otherwise. I think the, the one place where we can make mistakes is in assuming that these are infectious events and treating them as such, continuing the drugs, and, and that's, when, uh, I think that's when people can get in trouble. Because on the flip side, uh, patients who are promptly treated for immune-related AEs with steroids, over 90% of those are reversible toxicities. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go quickly through this. This is the phase two toxicity with Pembro, just making the point that it's basically the same, 9% grade three to four uh, related toxicities uh, and no uh, fatal toxicity uh, on this study. So, so overall, I think the safety profile is quite tolerable. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna shut off my phone, I apologize. For And, and quite similar to the, 
the tens of thousands of patients that have been treated with these drugs in solid tumor, which is nice also because it gives us a preview into what happens when you treat large number of patients. And as, as you guys know, now we're seeing these rarer toxicities, but that are quite significant, reports of myocarditis, et cetera. And, and, uh, and so we're gaining a lot from the, the vast use of these drugs in terms of knowing how likely they are to impact outpatients. So in the context of those trials, we're also able to, uh, to confirm the biological hypothesis. On the NEBO phase one study, we had access to 10 tumors from the patients on trial, and all of them had 9PT4 alteration. Uh, all of them had expression of PDL1, PDL2 on the surface of the Reed Schoenberg cells, and all of them had phospho SAT3 expression in the Reed Schoenberg cells, consistent with increased activation of the exact SAT pathway. Uh, the Pembro, uh, the, the company did those studies, but uh, the majority of, of tumors were PDL1 positive and PDL2 positive. And this is from the phase two NEBO study, uh, showing again in larger population the high frequency of 9PT4 deregulation, which tracked with this, this metric uh, called the H score, which basically multiplies the percentage of cells that are PD1 positive by the intensity of PD1 positivity. So it gives kind of an overall measure of the amount of PD1 uh, uh, on the tumor. Uh, and in fact, with what has come out of these studies, which is still preliminary but, uh, but interesting, is that if you separate tumors by this H score, so basically by amount of PDL1 expressed in tumors, there does seem to be an impact on PFS, but unlike what I showed you earlier with the 9PT4 amplification in untreated patients, here the patients that have a high H score tend to do better. So, so that's something which, which has been uh, uh, demonstrated many times in solid tumors is tumors that are PD positive tend to have higher response rates. Uh, and we're seeing the same thing even by the level of pd one abnormality. So in conclusion at this point, uh, it's, it's clear that in classical Hodgkin lymphoma, there is this near universal uh, 9PT4 abnormality that may be differentially prognostic for regular chemotherapy or uh, PD-1 blockade. And that could potentially have some bearing in the, the desire to combine these two things together and, and try to capture both ends of the immune spectrum of disease. And also the other conclusion I think which is uh, inescapable is that PD-1 blockade is a therapeutically effective tool for relapse refractory classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So now let's uh, move on to non-Hodgkin lymphoma a little bit, which is a, a uh, more a field really in evolution with still a lot of questions. There were some initial studies uh, that uh, should be given a nod uh, that were published now uh, eight or seven or eight years ago. One was with pitilizumab. Uh, pitilizumab is the only one that has PD in the name, so it's supposed to be a PD-1 antibody. In fact, it's the only one that's probably not an anti-PD-1, unfortunately. But we don't know what the target is. It does seem to be a checkpoint molecule of some sort, but it's a, a checkpoint in search of a target. Uh, nonetheless, there was a study in advanced immunologic malignancies uh, and a study of ipilimumab, which is a CTL4 antibody in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And the response rates uh, were quite low in those studies. But already they showed that it's possible to have some durable responses in, in large cell or follicular lymphoma uh, with just immune manipulation. Uh, so this, this suggested that checkpoint blockade could potentially be a promising approach in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but that there was going to be a lot of work needed to select the tumors or to select the targets. So going from what we know in, in terms of Hodgkin lymphoma to where can we apply that same type of thinking? Uh, and the most obvious place is probably primary mediastinal lymphoma, which is genetically the closest cousin of, of classical Hodgkin lymphoma and also has frequent uh, deregulation at 9PT4, uh, frequent translocation, it turns out, even translocations involving PDL2. And this has been shown by several different groups and resulting in the end uh, with, again, a high prevalence of PDL1 uh, and PDL2 expression on the actual tumor cell surface. And we now also have clinical results uh, in this disease. There was a, um, a primary mediastinal cohort within the Chemo 13 study of pembrolizumab, which uh, at last reported included 17 patients. A uh, response rate was 41%. Uh, this is patients with relapse refractory mediastinal lymphoma, which as you know, are, are hard patients to treat. Uh, and this is the waterfall plot, again, with even for the patients that did not achieve an objective response, the sense that they could get clinical benefit, and perhaps more importantly, 
again, the idea that the responses, even in this uh, aggressive disease, can be durable with, I think the last time this was um, uh, evaluated, the median duration of response hadn't been reached after about a year of follow-up. There's now an international phase two study that's ongoing, Keynote 170, and, and the hope is that through this study, we can confirm that, uh, that this drug has uh, therapeutic efficacy, but more importantly, I think, understand why and in which subsets. It's, it's possible because the, the 92P4 deregulations are rarer in mediastinal lymphoma, it's possible that we could find a correlation with response. It's possible that we will be able to figure out who are the 40% or so of patients who respond, which I think would be very useful in terms of thinking uh, and, and how to move this drug forward in, in this disease. Large cell lymphoma uh, is, uh, is a much uh, a tougher nut to crack with this, I think. So here's the spider plot of the phase one NEVO study. Uh, and when it was reported, it was reported with a, a response rate of about 36%. But actually, there's very few durable responses, as you can see here. And this translates into a, a disappointing PFA. Uh, now, that's a very small sample size, but it suggests that single-agent PD-1 blockade and unselected large cell lymphoma uh, may not be uh, as, um, as beneficial. There's a, a phase two study of NEVO that's been completed. It's actually completed a while back, still not reported. You can infer from that uh, what you will. Uh, but despite that, there may be, again, subsets of large cell lymphoma that can be teased out based on what we already know that may be more likely to respond. Probably the most important one is EDV-positive large cell lymphoma. Because as I said earlier, remember, EDV drives expression of, of PD-1 ligand. Uh, and in fact, as shown by Ben Chen, Scott Rodig in the study in 2013, EDV positive large cell lymphoma or EDV positive PTLD has a high frequency of PDL1 expression. This was a patient who we treated on a clinical trial with EDV positive disease, achieved a PR after two cycles of PD1 blockade. Uh, this patient is still in, in PR uh, after over six months of treatment. The, the related disease is T cell histiocyte rich large cell lymphoma, which is a rare subset but which is also sort of a different beast and characterized by, by a genetic signature that uh, is particularly rich in the host response genes, also has high prevalence of pd one and also in this most anecdotal finding, another pa uh, patient with this disease who was on the same clinical trial who achieved a PR, and, and you think, okay, I, I'm, I'm just showing you the best cases, which is true, but, <laughs> but, uh, but those are rare subtypes. So it's, it's actually a, rare, a, a relatively rare event for us to be able to have those patients to put on trial. And so far, it seems like they may, in fact, respond better. So the denominator is actually quite low, too. And then the latest uh, candidate into this field, actually the latest candidates, I should say, are primary testicular lymphoma. And, and most excitingly, I think to me, is a primary CNS lymphoma. Uh, it turns out they also harbor frequent 92P4 abnormalities. Uh, which, is, which is interesting, especially in the case of CNS lymphoma. Uh, and they respond to PD-1 blockade. So this is a patient who was treated off-label by my colleague uh, Lakshmi Nayak based on this biology who with uh, refractory uh, primary CNS lymphoma and achieved a CR uh, with four cycles of PD-1 blockade. And again, in case it's, it's cherry-picked, but, but Lakshmi has treated uh, now five patients uh, off-label, she and her colleagues, and uh, presented that experience at ASH, and actually all of them responded. Uh, so there is, there is something uh, in this disease that, again, may make it particularly sensitive to PD-1 blockade. And, and obviously those are just hints, but, but treating relapsed CNS lymphoma, finding something that works is, uh, is uh, something uh, worth pursuing, I think, because we don't have a, a ton of good alternatives. Uh, and also, Richter syndrome is very interesting. So there was a, a presentation uh, first at ASH in 2015 by the Mayo Group, uh, Wei Ding. Uh, it's interesting, as I understand the genesis of, of that study. So this is a CLL study. And there's really good reason to think that PD-1 blockade would be useful in CLL, again, because the malignant cells tend to express uh, pd one but because they didn't have anything for the Richter space, therefore the Richter spaces will allow it on Sunday. Uh, and it turns out, there was a, a very high response rate for relapse refractory Richter, right? Anything above zero, I think, is pretty high. So this was 43% among seven patients, and the CLL didn't respond. And in fact, uh, again, as I'm told, there were patients who had CLL and Richter at the same time, went on trial, Richter responds and not the CLL, which, which is uh, 
which is nice, A, because if it gives us a new drug for this disease, that would be most welcome, but it also presumably has a lot to teach us about the biology of this. Is there something that's happening in the transformation event that is increasingly immunogenic or, or uh, increasingly uh, dependent on immunization somehow? So that, uh, that I, I hope is also a story being written. All of these subtypes are being tested or about to be tested in phase two studies. So we'll know whether this is real or not real. And then lastly, a couple words about follicular lymphoma, which is still very much a story in the making. Again, there was a promising signal in the phase one study of nivolumab, uh, but unlike the large cell lymphoma, so this is still a very small number of patients, but the sense that the responses could be durable in this disease. What's interesting about this is that follicular lymphoma, as you, as you may know, does not express the PD-1 ligand. So this, in fact, was from a patient treated on this phase one study, and the same kind of double staining. So if you just look at the brown staining, you say, well, yes, this tumor does have a lot of PD-L1. It's true, but it's not on the tumor cells, which are here uh, shown with PAX-5. Uh, and that's been, that's been shown several times. There's a lot of PD-L1, PD-1 in the follicular lymphoma microenvironment, but it's not on the tumor cells. And yet, there are clearly some patients who can respond to drugs. So how that happens and how the whether or how important the microenvironment is in, um, in mediating responses to checkpoint blockade, uh, I think is a question that may be easiest to answer in this disease. And this, again, has been, has, has been very studied in, in solid tumors where there's still some controversy exactly about the role of pd one in uh, tumor cell versus microenvironment. Presumably both were important, but, um, <coughs> but this is a, a, a bit of a unique case perhaps. There's also a phase two study that's been completed with NEVO, also not reported, but, but which uh, I hope will teach us much about the biology of this uh, in follicular lymphoma. And then there are a couple of other notable results that uh, I think uh, deserve to be up here. So one is a study that was done at MD Anderson, rituximab plus pitalizumab, or exizumab, uh, which had a, a high response rate and a high CR rate. Those were rituxan-sensitive patients, so it's not clear exactly how much is rituxan, how much is a drug, but it's enough of a signal, I think, that uh, there may be something worthwhile in this approach. Uh, and then the, uh, there's a um, uh, 4-1-DB agonist, which is a, a, um, a stimulator of T-cell response, unlike checkpoint, which are antagonists. Uh, and this, combined with rituxan, had some reasonable response rate, 21%, uh, which again is not very high, but, but if you look at the details of that study, there was really the ability to take patients who were quite refractory to follicular lymphoma and induce responses that were quite, that were very durable. So this is, uh, this study is ongoing and, and uh, will probably last a while. But I think 4-1-DB agonist uh, may be an interesting drug in, in follicular lymphoma. And then there's a lot of biology, which I'm not showing you, that, that came out of Stanford looking at OSC-42 in follicular lymphoma, which is another, another sort of uh, co-stimulatory molecule. Uh, and, uh, and again, in this particular disease, it seems very rich in checkpoint biology. So I hope this is something that, that can be leveraged uh, with therapeutic success. Okay, so now let me go back to Hodgkin and, and start again with that in mind, with the, the slide that I ended the first part with, which is to say that PD-1 blockade is effective for relapsed refractory Hodgkin. And that is true, but you say, well, so, so what exactly does that mean and what can we achieve with these drugs? Uh, clearly, we can achieve very high, res or high response rates. Uh, that, there are now 500 patients on study. That's not going anywhere. So we know we have, uh, we have response rate, respon objective responses in about two-thirds of patients. Tumor responses in almost all of them. If you look at the waterfall plot, no matter what the cohort is, it's over 90% tumor response rate. Uh, but at the same time, the CR rates are quite low. Uh, they're probably in the 10 to 20% range overall. And, and what about the durability? And again, this is, a, this is really, I think, a, a key question, at least in my mind. The hope was based on this type of study. So this has nothing to do with lymphoma. Uh, this is a study of uh, melanoma patients, I think about 2,000 patients almost, with melanoma treated with ITI. And, and of course, what, what I think everybody uh, loves about this curve is the apparent plateau. So the idea that even in a disease like melanoma, there is a subset of patients, small subset, but a size, of, but a, a, a non-negligible subset, who is still in remission. If you can see what the x-axis -ax, x here, it's 10 years. Uh, that's, that's a remarkable result, right? 
And that's in a disease where the response rate to CD1 blockade is in the 35, maybe 40 percent. And now we have a disease at Hodgkin lymphoma where the response rate is twice as high. So the hope was, are we going to see a plateau that's twice as high? Uh, and we don't know, but, but it does seem like on all the studies of CD1 blockade that have followed for a year, two years, uh, we're hitting the median PFS. So, so it's not, it does not seem likely that at least the majority of patients are going to be in durable response with single agent CD1 blockade, despite their genetic uh, background of Hodgkin lymphoma. And, and so, so one might ask, if, in th if that's the case, who is it that is going to have a durable response? And is it dependent, for example, on the quality of remission? For most of the drugs that we're used to thinking about in lymphoma, achieving a CR is very beneficial. And is a, it becomes a, an endpoint sort of in and of itself. And uh, that may not be true for checkpoint blockade. There is a, a sense, as the one that I've shown here, uh, this is from the phase two study, the cohorts A and B of MEVO that was presented at ASH. See, maybe the sense that, that the PFS is better in the patients who are in CR in green than the patients who are in PR, but it's not that different. Uh, and regardless, you clearly can have a PR and get durable benefit from these drugs. That's even if it's better to be in CR, it's not necessary to be in CR to achieve durable benefit. So what is the kind of response that we need? Is checkpoint blockade screwing up our PET scan? Is it that a negative PET scan doesn't mean what it means when you use cytotoxic therapy? And how do we figure it out? I don't know. Uh, but I, I do think that it is very important in our field to think about checkpoint block specific response criteria. So we learn what these mean. Uh, the, the flip side of where it's important is for the assessment and management of progressive disease. And again, this borrows heavily from the solid tumor world where we know we see things like pseudo progression or late pseudo progression uh, and that these people can continue to derive benefit from treatment. In lymphoma, we only at this point have really anecdotal evidence. Uh, so this, for example, was the, um, the spider plot for the MEVO phase one study that I've shown you. And you see there's this patient who had, it's actually over 100% increase in tumor size uh, at the first imaging time point uh, and, and really clear progression of, of disease in the lung and the pleura uh, continued on treatment and achieved a deep PR. Uh, and this comes from the phase two study looking at the patients who develop PD by virtue of developing a new lesion, which is something quite common. You see six months out, uh, there's overall a significant reduction in tumor burden, but they patient may get a new two centimeter FCG added node. Sometimes that's not lymphoma if you biopsy it, sometimes it is. And yet if you continue to treat these patients or continue to follow them as done here, you can see that they continue to benefit long past the occurrence of the, of the red X's. So th there was this, um, this effort to, to categorize this, uh, this type of atypical responses, which led to this, uh, the so-called lyric criteria, which were an attempt to develop basically criteria for when to call patients PD and how to manage them with checkpoint blockade, uh, which may not end up being the final answer, but, but hopefully gives us something to use within the context of clinical trials, because right now it's very haphazard. Right now, different clinical trials tell you to do different things, and clinicians probably do something different from what's in the protocol in the first place. So it's very hard to collect good data and to know when we should continue to treat patients and when we shouldn't. The flip side is we don't want to expose patients to a toxicity of therapy that they're not going to benefit from, never mind the cost. So that, that's part of, that, that was really what Lyric was for, uh, but I think now the, the, the second question that, would, that one could ask with the data sets that we have uh, is the other one is how do we categorize responses? How do we figure out who has a good enough response that they should continue to be treated or, or should go on alternative therapy? Uh, and, then, and then as part of that search, I think there is an extensive uh, interest in looking at biomarkers, which we don't have right now. We're not able to really predict based on tumor biology or, or circulating markers uh, who is going to do well with PD-1 blockade. The most that we have, I think, at this point with checkpoint blockade is uh, relates to what I showed you earlier about the level of 9P24 uh, amplification and showing, this is again from the phase two, that the highest level amplification, so the patients that had what's called formally amplification, so over ninefold increase in the, um, in the, the 
924 uh, region tended to have a higher CR rate. So this is in green and tended to have a lower PD rate. So it may be that, again, that that, that those abnormalities uh, um, associate with the quality of response. But at the same time, they're clearly patients who have low level abnormalities who can have uh, a good CR. So it's not enough to use clinically. Uh, it's just enough for us to maybe teach us something. The other one that I think uh, was uh, providing a lot of hope was the antigen presentation mechanism. So, so Hodgkin lymphoma, it's been known for a while, actually there are many papers about this, that uh, Hodgkin lymphoma frequently lacks HLA class one or functional HLA class two. Uh, and now it's being done increasingly, these studies in larger cohorts, and it's the majority of, the majority of tumors lack HLA class one, lack a functional uh, HLA class one, uh, sometimes because it downregulates or mutates beta two microglobulin and HLA class two. And in some tumors, there's neither functional class one nor class two. So if you look at this, uh, at these prevalences of NHC1 and NHC2 deficiencies, and you relate that to the response rate, especially if you think about tumor response rate. So if 90% of the tumors shrink, and yet at least half of them lack HLA1 and HLA2, what is it that mediates responses? And so what cellular effector doesn't mediate class one or class two? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> but this is also, I think, a, a field of active investigation it does, at least based on the numbers, it seems unlikely that uh, the expression of HLA will be directly informative of who's going to respond. It may matter, again, for the quality of response, uh, but, but it's not going to be enough probably to tell us whether a patient uh, should or should not uh, get a trial of PD inductor. So regardless, at the end of the day, uh, I think PD-1 blockade is not going to be a cure for the majority of patients with class 4 Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, I hope that there are patients who can be in long-term remission, but it's not likely to be the majority, and it's not clear if anybody's uh, going to be cured with these drugs. So well, wha why does that matter so much? It, it matters for many obvious reasons. It makes a huge difference, especially given the patient population that we're treating. Remember, that all those clinical trials, the median age is 30, 35. So at 35, uh, if, you, if you have a five-year remission or a cure, that's that's quite different. And it's true at 65 too, obviously, but, but it's different. There's something unique about Hodgkin lymphoma in this respect. And we don't know how long we treat patients for. Uh, these are very expensive drugs, which we as a society uh, have to pay for. Uh, and now patients are getting treatment for years. We don't know who needs it. We don't know who's going to continue to benefit. Uh, but, but we will bear the cost, both the direct cost and the toxicity cost of that ignorance, I think. Uh, and then. And then clinically, say th the reason it matters is because we always have to think about what the alternative treatment is for those patients. Um, so the alternative for patients with relapse refractory class 4 Hodgkin lymphoma, now there isn't that much in terms of other drugs. Uh, brentuximab obviously is a very good drug. There is a, a trial now, the, the Merck confirmatory study, which is comparing brentuximab to pembrolizumab. And uh, you're probably too polite to roll your eyes, so I'll roll mine. Say, okay, so what are we going to learn from that? Um, one may be better, which is good for the company, you get approval, et cetera, but for me, it doesn't matter. You can do Brentax and then Pembro or Pembro and then Brentax, and that probably doesn't make any difference. So that's, that's not really, I think, a, a pressing question for, for us or for people who treat patients. This is the pressing question, I think. Uh, and this has, it's, it's a minor parenthesis of a, of the talk and, and of a lot of things. It doesn't affect that many patients, but I can tell you this is the question that I get asked the most by far, <coughs> is what to do about allotransplant. Uh, so because of that, I'm gonna take the liberty of boring you for a while about this parenthesis. So what about PD-1 and allo? Uh, I, I think it's fascinating, but again, for the few times that it comes up in clinic, it's a, it's a bear of a question. Why? Uh, because the, the question is, if you have a patient, let's say with Hodgkin lymphoma, refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, let's say with relapse after an allotransplant, the only thing that we know that has curative potential is an allotransplant. It's not great, but it can cure patients. And, and you and I have those patients in our clinic that were cured by allotransplant. As I told you, PD-1 blockade, but so far hasn't cured anybody. So if you have a patient who is, let's say, in remission with PD-1 blockade, should that patient go to transplant? And and is it possible that prior PD-1 blockade, 
because it's immune active, will affect the outcome of the transplant. And you could imagine it could make it more effective by stimulating or by, by increasing the graft-based or lymphoma effect, or it could make it more toxic by increasing GDHC. There's a lot of, of really cool biology that's been done in this, uh, a lot of it by Bruce Glazer in Minnesota, uh, and I'm gonna show you quickly two experiments. Uh, one is this one, so th these were mice that get uh, bone marrow transplant, uh, and, uh, and you can do, so you can do the marrow and the T cells and do it in a pd one negative background, pd 2 negative background. As you can see here, the black squares are the, the mice that get regular marrow uh, and may eventually all die of GDHC. If you give, uh, if you give it to pd one negative recipients, they die of accelerated GDHC, suggesting that at least in the early post-transplant period, pd one in particular is important for maintaining a GDHC type homeostasis. This is the flip side. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated experiment, but these are mice that get a uh, syngenic or an allo transplant and then get challenged with AML and get adoptive T cell uh, therapy later on. So if you do that, this is, these are the mice when they get challenged with AML, uh, and, and this is late for the mice after transplant, but it turns out that the, the AML stimulates PD-1 expression on the surface of T cells. And if you block PD-1 pathway with monoclonal antibodies, the mice survive the AML challenge. And also it doesn't seem to create a lot of chronic GDHC. So this, this type of work suggests that maybe in the later post allo period, it could be that PD-1 blockade will uh, promote graft versus lymphoma, or graft versus leukemia effect. Uh, and there's also some, some very nice work that was done by the, by the uh, French group um, that, that showed that even within the, the animal, uh, the importance of PD-1 uh, mattered where you look. So in lymph nodes, there was much more PD-1 activity uh, than there was, say, in liver. So it may be that immune organs and GDHC target organ have separate PD-1 biology, which makes this hopelessly complicated, but at least raises caution that we may do harm with these drugs in the allotransplant setting and hope that we may do benefit. So what do we know clinically? Now we know a little bit. Uh, there was a, a, a cohort, so, so these, these were patients that were transplanted at, at our institution at, at Dana-Farber uh, because we had a lot of patients who had lymphoma who got PD-1 blockade. And I tell you, at least for me initially, those patients I thought of like other patients we treat in that setting, which is okay, if you're lucky enough to get them in remission, uh, we should think about allotransplant if they're candidates, or the patients, the many patients who relapse uh, off of PD-1 blockade who were fortunate enough to get back in remission with something else, again, were transplant candidates. So, so we had 19 patients who we transplanted. All of them got re reduced sensitivity allo. And, and what we saw among 19 patients, which is a, an admittedly small sample, but there were three cases of very severe early GDHC. Okay, well, we see that, you know, we see early severe GDHC, but so see it three out of 19 times a lot. And, and I'm talking the stuff that we don't see. Like within day 14, rip roaring, steroid refractory, acute GDHC with mouth involvement, eye involvement. Well, that's not right. Like how often do you see that, right? With Rick Allo. Uh, and the other thing was three cases of VOD. And, and to be honest, it took me until the third one to think, okay, this is not right either. Like wh what is it, is a Rick transplant? These patients have no business getting VOD in the first place. And for the first patient, there was an excuse, you know, we thought, okay, well, it's because he had RAP immune. And then the second patient, because he had a lot of prior therapy. And then the third time, so no RAP immune, no, you know, not, non ablative transplant. And, and the other thing, I'll tell you, that just anecdotally, that's interesting. So the last patient had VOD, had VOD with very high transaminitis, which, again, happens, but it doesn't happen that often. Uh, and so we, we treated her with defibrotide, but also with steroids thinking that maybe there was some immune stimulant uh, to, to this. And, and she went into a, a rapid CR, did fine, is still alive and doing very well. And all of these are really anecdotes, but, but they're anecdotes that, that make me, or that, that made us wonder whether those toxicities were potentiated by cry pd one blockade. Um, so overall, the one-year non-relapse mortality was 22%, which is too high for a RIC cohort. On the flip side, there were very few relapses. So the one-year cumulative incidence of relapse was 11%. And what we did, just because it's such a heterogeneous population, is that, okay, well, what happens if you look by like disease risk index max, just to get a sense of what the expected relapse rate would be in, in that type of cohort, uh, it was about 
which I think is, you know, for those of you who transplant patient lymphoma, that's kind of, seems like a reasonable estimate. About a third of patients will relapse uh, within a year. So 11% is quite low. And remember, a lot of these patients are Hodgkin lymphoma. Hodgkin tends to relapse after Ehlers. Uh, so overall, the PFS at one year was 67%, which is pretty good, which is pretty good overall. So, so now uh, we have a, a larger cohort, which is 39 patients from asking other people to, to participate and, and share data on the, on the patients who they transplant after P1 blockade. Uh, and, and the results overall are similar. There were, there were fewer severe toxicities, so, so the numbers look better in terms of toxicity. The, the initial experience was a little bit diluted. Uh, but still, a one-year NRM of 14%, one-year uh, incidence of relapse of 11% versus 26% expected in this cohort. Uh, still, a grade three to four acute GVHD, 23% incidence at one year, and 13% grade four, which is on the high side uh, for, this, for this type of cohort, and excuse me, 41% chronic GVHD. Uh, so this is the PFS curve, and again, I think that that's a pretty good PFS curve for 40 patients with advanced lymphoma getting an hour transplant, at least in my mind. But here's something, here's something puzzling. So we had, uh, for, the, for the patients that were at, at our institution, and for most of them, we had blood, bank blood. Uh, and so we could do immunophenotypes, okay, what's different about those patients? And we're hoping to see what's different about the patients that had bad toxicity. Uh, nothing that we could find, it turns out, was different. But if you look, so this is, you probably can't see from where you are, but this is looking at the PD-1 positive cells. So the top rows are PD-1 positive Treg, PD-1 positive PD-4s, and PD-1 positive PD-8. And here are the patients that had PD-1 blockade before, and here are control patients, try to control for disease, for type of transplant, imperfectly matched, but still, and a lymphoma allo patient population that never saw PD-1 blockade. And I don't really know how to read heat maps, but when I look at it, I say, oh, the color looks a little different, right? So the color is different because basically the patients that had tried PD-1 blockade come to transplant with essentially no PD-1 positive T cells. Say, oh, that, that makes sense, right? They, they, they just had PD-1 blockade. Except the time, the median time from PD-1 blockade to transplant was months. And if you look at the rows, which you can't read, but so this is viewer's baseline. One, two, three, six, 12 months after allo. So you say 12 months after allo with donor T cells now. They don't have PD-1 T cells. So what's happening? How is this, how is PD-1 blockade influencing so distally and potentially influencing in donor cells? I have no idea. I really, I, I have no idea. There is something, it seems like, so we, we know that the drugs hang out in tissue for a while, probably much longer than they hang out in blood. So it's not surprising to have a, an ongoing effect of PD-1 blockade, but, but how it can last so long and affect T cells so profoundly and affect them in the donor suggests that there may be some self-perpetuating change, some self-perpetuating immune change. Uh, and, and that could be, it could be that this is why transplant is different after PD-1 blockade. Um, so this, I, I hope this is something that, that can be confirmed or, or expanded. Uh, there are two other cohorts I'll tell you about quickly. One is from, uh, from BMS uh, through their, their trial. So they looked at the patients who went with Hodgkin, who went from their trial to, uh, to allo transplant. So there were 40 patients, six here and death. There is actually some overlap between this cohort and the last one because of the way they were collected. And this one, we don't have a lot of good information. For example, we don't have good relapse information, so it's hard to give good TRM estimates. But, but uh, the Ka Kaplan-Meier estimate of TRM was 17% at six months, which again is high. And the uh, estimate of grade three, four GVHD was 26%. So consistent with what I showed you before. Uh, on the Merck phase one trial, there were 13 patients who went to ALO uh, at some point, either in remission or subsequent. And in this cohort, there was only one patient who had a, a fatal complication who had VOD HANA. Um, so so that, that looks a little bit uh, safer, if you will, but it's, a small, it's, a, it's still a small cohort. Um, so I think the, the conclusion that I would draw from this is that allo after PD-1 blockade is a complicated question. Uh, it is likely associated with some early immune toxicity, particularly GVHD possibly venoocclusive disease, 
But at the end of the day, it's definitely feasible. Right? The, the TFS is actually savable. I think, I think it would be a mistake to think of PD1 blocker as a contraindication to allo transplant. Uh, the question is what to do with patients who are in remission with PD1 blockade. Uh, and that still doesn't answer that because you can take them to transplant and, and they will have a reasonable PFS, but they may have really significant toxicity. Or you can continue drugs, and there are likely some of them who will be in really long remission, but you don't know who they are. So how do you navigate that one? Uh, I don't know. I really, I really don't know. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, what I see around me is everybody has their own take on this, and everybody does something different. There's not really consensus in the field uh, as to what we should be doing. Uh, I, I can tell you, because I feel bad not committing. Uh, I, when I started, I would take all these patients to transplant. They were admitted they, and they were young. It's like, okay, go to transplant because we know at least I can cure you. Uh, now I don't take anybody to transplant who's in remission with PD-1 blockade. Uh, and that's, that's based on uh, a few considerations. One is that those toxicities, those deaths, uh, transplant deaths, for, for all of you who do transplant, are very hard to stomach. Uh, the patient who's in a CR with Nevo doing great, you know, at 30, at work, getting married, gets a transplant and dies of DVAC three months later, uh, th that patient you, you can't forget. Uh, now, I know that's not the way to practice medicine, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's still inescapable. Uh, and also because I think the, the other thing we're seeing is we're seeing patients who come to PD-1 blockade now earlier, so they haven't had 12 different lines of treatment. They've had a few different lines of treatment, which means they have a few left. Uh, and I, it, it's possible that PD-1 blockade sensitizes patients to subsequent chemo. So what we've seen, again, anecdotally, is that patients who re, uh, progress on PD-1 blockade and then get chemo seem to have surprisingly good responses. And I've seen patients, let's say, who are refractory to the drug I got a patient with Hodgkin lymphoma who's refractory to GBP. Eventually gets on PD-1 blockade, has a mixed response, progresses, GND, and gets a CR. Okay, so GND is not GBP, but still, right, to go from progression on GBP to CR with GND, th th there's probably something there. So that's the hope for me is that if, you, if you're willing to do that, that if you keep those patients on study, hopefully some, or on treatment, some of them hopefully can do well for a long period of time, and if they progress, I hope you can salvage them and then take them to transplant and understanding that transplant is still doable uh, after subsequent therapy. So anyway, that's, that's the end of that point. Um, so there are a lot of other questions such as would the effect of PD-1 blockade change in combination? There are tons of combination studies now around with chemo, with brentuximab, with other checkpoint blockers, with this bispecific antibody, the study that started with a, a drug uh, from a company called Afimed, uh, now interested in combining with CAR T-cell, with BITE. So all over, PD-1 blockade is being added to, and I say it's a, a little bit uh, ex in an exaggerated fashion, but I have yet to see a mouse model where PD-1 is not synergistic with whatever the drug is. So it's always synergistic. Um, at the same time, there is a, a, a bit of a cost to success. So if this is the, this is the waterfall plot, some, some waterfall plot from PD-1 blockade, say, okay, you're gonna do a combination, what are you gonna look for? Okay. What are you gonna, how are you gonna improve this, right? Case in point, this is Nevo plus Itty, which in melanoma, I think provides a, apparently provides a benefit. Uh, <coughs> this is 74% response rate. This is the waterfall plot. Do we do anything? I don't know. Looks pretty much the same to me, but, but we don't know. We have to follow those patients two to three years to see if the PFS is different. But those are hard studies to do. So it's, it's difficult to do those combination studies, at least in Hodgkin. And then the other question is whether the effect would change in earlier line of therapy, and now PD-1 blockade is predictably sort of blanketing the treatment space, frontline, first relapse, post-auto, et cetera. Um, this was the Nevo plus Brent Tux first salvage that was presented at ASH by Alex Herrera, 90% response rate, 62% CR, which is good. There are other regimens that have similar response rates, so by, by itself, not clear whether this is going to be the next best thing, but it's out there. Yeah. And then in the few minutes that I don't have left, uh, I'm just going to uh, talk briefly about 
about what this means beyond lymphoma, because we spent so much time talking about Hodgkin lymphoma, which is a, a relatively infrequent uh, malignancy, fortunately. But I think Hodgkin lymphoma is a very unique feature uh, and a different feature because of this, right? Because the response rates are so high. Uh, there is this mechanism of enforced positive expression, which is very unique. So in, in a lot of other malignancies, we know PD-L1 expression is a dynamic event. In, you can even biopsy people serially, and sometimes PD-L1 expression changes. Uh, but, but probably not in Hodgkin, or at least not as much. Uh, it's also a disease with remarkably high prevalence of uh, deficiency in antigen presentation, as we talked about, which has to teach us something about the mechanism of action of these drugs. It has a very rich microenvironment, which we're not going to talk about, but there's actually a, an interaction between PDL1 on the tumor cells and PDL1 in the tumor infiltrating macrophages. And we have now uh, about 500 patients on clinical trial. So we have this unique opportunity for obtaining tissue, for analyzing tissue, for looking at mechanism of action, mechanism of resistance, which will be different, at least in some way, from that of the solid tumor. For example, you guys saw the, the papers in melanoma where beta-2 microglobulin provides an escape mechanism. But that's not likely to be the case in Hodgkin because so many of them lack beta-2 end to begin with. Right? So, so maybe we can learn something new. Uh, and ultimately, I, I, I hope that's what helps us to design better combinations to find the place of PD-1 blockade in the treatment course of, of Hodgkin lymphoma, and ultimately perhaps to give back to oncology and to, to take the insights that we can learn here uh, and, and hopefully to apply them to the, uh, the broader field. That's it. That was the real thing. But thank you very much for, for your attention, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>